Yeah, we, uh, so we will be recording. We just want to let uh, people know that. But we will now go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Virginia Theological Seminary's modified commemoration of the martyrdom of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, our topic is an exploration of reparations at Virginia Theological Seminary. Of course, we had additional plans for our commemoration of Dr. King for this year, including worship and all the things that we would normally do. However, COVID-19 obviously had other plans, uh, but God is faithful and merciful, and we are grateful for the ability to take to the internet this evening and to share uh, this time with one another. So hello to all of you who are joining via Zoom and via Facebook. My name is Joe Thompson. I'm Assistant Professor of Race and Ethnicity Studies and Director of Multicultural Ministries at Virginia Theological Seminary. Um, VTS announced last fall that it would be instituting a reparations program. And we thought that an evening devoted to the topic of reparations would be a suitable tribute to the legacy of Dr. King and the struggle for black liberation that he did so much to advance. And so this evening, we have two very, very special guests. The Reverend Joseph Constant will give us a sense of why reparations are appropriate given the history of the Black presence at Virginia Theological Seminary. And Dr. Catherine Meeks will help us to think about some of the key theological and philosophical questions involved in reparations as we move the program forward. So again, I welcome all of you, and I thank you very much for your interest and for your time. At this point, uh, for those of you who don't already know her uh, already, I'm going to introduce Ms. Sarah Stone Cypher, Manager of Operations and Digital Missioner in our Lifelong Learning Department. She's going to get us all acclimated uh, to the platform for the evening. Um, but before I turn it over to her, I just want to definitely express my deep gratitude uh, to her for helping to put all of this together, uh, which I definitely would not have been able to do uh, by myself and without her help. Um, I'd also like to thank our communications department, uh, Chris, uh, Curtis Prather, Elizabeth Panix leach and Kristen Lasso for their support of the program this evening. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to tell us more about logistics and get us acclimated. Absolutely. So as you all can see, we're currently on a webinar. As part of a webinar, only the panelists, these five faces and voices will be shown throughout the, throughout the program. Um, as Dr. Meeks and Reverend Constant present, their faces will get bigger, so then that way we can just focus on them. We'll also have time for question and, questions and answers. Those who are on Zoom can use the chat box or the question and answer box, so I think you all have found it pretty well already. And and those who are on Facebook can go ahead and um, just uh, write a comment and I will go ahead and see it. At the end, Reverend Dr. Joseph Thompson and I, we have two Josephs here, um, Reverend Dr. Thompson and I will go ahead and um, give voice to those comments um, and questions and then uh, Dr. Meeks and Reverend Constant will go ahead and um, answer them in turn. So I'm happy to answer any other questions um, through the chat box or through the Facebook comments if you have any connection issues um, or anything else. Great, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, at this time, we're gonna turn it over to our Dean and President, the very Reverend Ian Markham for special words of welcome. Dean Markham. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to be with you. Let me just start by expressing my gratitude and admiration to the team who put this uh, program together. Um, where I'm enormously grateful to uh, Dr. Joseph Constant constantly uh, for, his, um, Dr. for his, his role he played in this institution, to Dr. Do Joe Thompson uh, for his continuing work in this place, uh, to Dr. Meeks for joining us for this presentation. I, I really do feel I'm honored to be uh, able to uh, participate in this panel in this capacity. So just a few words of observation and comments about the significance of the program tonight. As you all know, we're approaching our bicentennial, 200 years of, of service uh, as a place of formation for the Episcopal Church. 
and it's a, a, a milestone of enormous significance. And I've talked often about the fact that our history is a mixture of grace and sin. Uh, so, of course, we're grateful to God for all the accomplishments in our 200-year history. But we're very conscious of the injustices that must also be repented, and uh, especially our participation in the institutions of slavery and Jim Crow. So in 2009, uh, when Dr. Constant was part of the seminary, uh, I did issue an apology uh, for these heinous sins as a leader of the institution on behalf of the institution, uh, by virtue of my office, representing uh, that uh, role of, of um, repentance that we are obligated to do in the face of the sin that we had committed. Uh, but with the bicentennial, we want to tell the complete story of the school and uh, with an awareness that reparations is a key discussion in the broader American society, uh, we decided as a seminary to take another step. And that step is to further lift up the stories of African Americans at the seminary, to recognize African American resilience in spite of oppressive conditions, and to take a step towards providing some material acknowledgement of the suffering caused by the institution. Uh, and though, obviously, we know full well that no amount of money could ever make up for the heinous nature of these institutions and the sin we participated in, we nevertheless wanted to at least take a step in that direction. And so in September of last year with uh, Dr. Thompson, we announced our reparations program. And as the program continues to evolve, I'm pleased to welcome you all here for what I'm sure will be rich presentations that help us to shape reparations at Virginia Theological Seminary. Please allow me to just say a few words about the immediate context in which we're thinking about these questions. I'm very aware that uh, we're all utterly and totally preoccupied by the constant and distressing news about COVID-19. And we're lifting up our prayers for all who've been affected by this insidious disease, whether directly or indirectly. So let's just pause for a moment in silence to remember those who died, the medical professionals on the front lines, and those who are sick, and those whose livelihoods have been devastated. At any time of crisis, wider attention is focused on how one accesses healthcare. Uh, more attention is given to aspects of the social safety net. More attention is given to the way uh, one can weather the storms of life. And as we engage in the discussion tonight, it's important for us all to remember that the crimes committed against the African-American community did not just affect one or two generations, but the effects have been perpetrated down to this very day and have had an impact throughout this society, which means that a crisis like COVID-19 pandemic may actually pose even greater problems for segments of the African-American community. And so it's very fitting that we would not cancel this evening's discussion, but rather we're going to carry on with it. And we hope that our conversation tonight and our evolving program of reparations might play some small part in creating a society in which the precious humanity and gifts of all God's children might flourish for the glory of our Creator. So thank you for joining us tonight. And we uh, now I invite uh, Joe. And as we segue to Joe, let me reiterate where I started. Um, we are blessed to have you in the faculty, Joe. We're grateful for the things you do for this institution. We're grateful for the witness that, and, uh, that you, you provide and the place in which you are taking us. So over to you, sir. 
Thank you very much, Dean Markham. Um, appreciate those kind words. Um, I want to take this opportunity before we turn to our guest speakers to provide everybody with a reminder of some of the details of uh, the seminary's budding reparations program and to update you a bit on where things stand. So the three main groups with which our program seeks to connect are one, descendants of enslaved persons who worked on this campus. Um, number two, descendants of African Americans who worked on campus during the Jim Crow era. And number three, uh, the local African American congregations with which VTS has historical ties, namely Mead Memorial Episcopal Church and Oakland Baptist Church. With the descendant groups, our goal is to connect with them in order to, uh, first of all, reinforce the apology from VTS uh, for this participation in those unjust and oppressive uh, regimes. It is also to then invite uh, the descendants to get to know VTS and who, what, who and what the institution is uh, today. It is also then to discuss memorializing the ancestors of those descendants uh, on campus and to ensure that the stories of their ancestors become a part of the seminary's uh, official history, if you will. And lastly, we will of course discuss what those descendants uh, feel would be proper usage of the proceeds of the $1.7 million endowment that the seminary created as a starting seed for uh, financial reparations. Um, so up to date, what has been going on? Well, we've been really in the research phase of the program, trying to identify the names of enslaved persons and Jim Crow era workers and their descendants. Um, we have a research team that includes our seminary archivist, Chris Pote, uh, who is logged in this evening, with support from Ebony Davis, the archivist for the African American Episcopal Historical Collection, and uh, she's also logged in this evening. Um, others on the team from the local research community who have uh, agreed to share their great expertise with us are Char McCargo Ba, uh, Nathania Nay Miles, Elizabeth Drembus and Maddie McCoy. And I'm not sure some of them were thinking about joining us this evening. I hope that uh, they may be present and maybe they can uh, speak up in the chat box uh, if they are. But uh, they have uncovered a lot of historical information that we did not know before, including, um, uh, to my knowledge, and, and maybe they can update me if there's more that I'm not aware of, but we have, uh, they have found the first names of several enslaved individuals who worked at Virginia Theological Seminary. And they've also identified probably scores of Jim Crow era descendants um, and have conducted a number of in-depth interviews with Jim Crow era descendants. And so I would be remiss if I did not offer my profuse thanks to Chris, Ebony, Char, Nay, Elizabeth, and Maddie for the work that they've done so far. And the last thing I'll say is that we do have a reparations uh, subcommittee of the Dean's Task Force on Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity. And it has been working on the medium term and longer term phases of the project. Uh, and I'll just recognize that the members are uh, myself, uh, Bishop Phoebe Rofe, who's the Vice Chair of our Board of Trustees, Vice President uh, Jackie Ballou, uh, Chris Pote and Ebony Davis, uh, whom I've already mentioned, and lastly, Riley Temple, uh, who is a member of the class of 2014, an, an alum of the seminary. And eventually we will uh, seek to have representation from the descendants on that team as we, as we actually identify more and more uh, descendants We'll be looking to, to do that. So there you have just a little bit of an update and you have the opportunity to ask more questions about uh, the actual program later on when we get to the question and answer period if you would like to do that. At this time, it is my great honor to introduce our first speaker, the Reverend Joseph Constant. A native of Haiti, Joseph was ordained as a deacon in 2003 and as a priest in 2004. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from Northeastern University and a Master of Divinity from our very own Virginia Theological Seminary. 
After graduation from seminary, he served as assistant rector at St. Timothy's Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. for almost two years. Then he joined the staff at Virginia Theological Seminary in 2005 as assistant to the dean for admissions and community life. During his time at VTS, Dr. Const uh, Reverend Constant created the Office of Racial and Ethnic Ministries and served as uh, the inaugural director of Ethnic Ministries. And I am uh, very aware that I follow in uh, Father Constant's footsteps and um, am just grateful for the groundwork that he laid for all of us who've been in this position. In 2010, following the earthquake in Haiti, Reverend Constant joined the staff of the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church as a special coordinator for Haiti. Um, and the task of the special coordinator for Haiti was to facilitate the multiple efforts among Episcopal churches, dioceses, networks, and organizations committed to the rebuilding of the Diocese of Haiti. In 2005, he established the Haiti MICA Project Incorporated, or also known as HMP, a nonprofit committed to serving the needs of the at-risk and homeless children of Mir Belay, Haiti. Through a vast network of partnerships created by HMP, over 450 children receive a hot meal on a daily basis and have access to basic education. Reverend Constant has published a book entitled No Turning Back, The Black Presence at Virginia Theological Seminary, which is of course the title of his presentation this evening. He's also published work on James Cone that can be found in the Blackwell Companion to the Theolo Blackwell Companion to the Theologians, edited by our own Dean Markham. Reverend Constant and his wife Sarah have two daughters, Claire and Christiana, and in his free time he loves playing and watching soccer, especially with his children, who are both soccer players. So please uh, welcome the Reverend Joseph Constant. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. Thank you for your kind introduction. Good evening, everyone. It is my honor uh, to serve as one of the lecturers uh, on this occasion as we commemorate the martyrdom of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, I am delighted for the opportunity uh, to present alongside uh, Dr. Catherine Mix. Uh, I am grateful to you, uh, Dr. Joe Thompson, uh, for extending the invitation to me and for the wonderful work that you are doing at VTS. Uh, thank you, uh, Sarah Stonesteifer, for your help with uh, the logistics uh, for this webinar. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dean uh, Ian Markham for his support of uh, this commemoration over the years, uh, and also for his support of our ministries long after uh, we leave uh, VTS. Um, I am thankful uh, to all of you uh, for attending uh, this event. No turning back. How do we remember and engage our history as we move forward together? Go he into all the world and preach the gospel. Has long been the call of Virginia Theological Seminary Generations of students read these words almost daily as they were inscribed over the altar in the seminary chapel. The question has always been, who should go and to whom should they go? For over 140 years of its existence, VTS's call was for white men to engage in ministry. Only in the last 69 years has VTS even allowed full-time black students to enroll in the Master of Divinity program. The story and struggle of many of the students is told in their own voice in my book, No Turning Back, The Black Presence at Virginia Theological Seminary. I was privileged to hear the stories of my fellow graduates, many who came before me and who endured and worked so hard to break barriers in the Episcopal Church and in the seminary. Shortly after Dean Ian Markham came to Virginia Theological Seminary in 2007, I organized a meeting 
between Dean Markham and a group of black graduates. There were seven of us that came together that day. During my time working at VTS, I had spent a significant amount of time meeting with black graduates and listening to their stories and their frustrations. I learned that too many of the graduates and other leaders in the church did not trust the seminary, struggled with its history and perceived a culture of racism. Part of my job was to engage in the discussion and help bridge the gap between the seminary and its graduates. This meeting with Dean Markham was one of several that had occurred over my then three years working at the seminary. One of the graduates present at the meeting had vowed never to return to VTS as he was so angry with the way he was treated as a student at the seminary. Just getting him to the campus was a milestone, but it was so important that these voices be heard. Many similar stories are chronicled in the book. The Reverend Hodgson Murphy, VTS class of 1973, talks about it in his interview. He said, and I quote, Dean Markham and I sat and talked, and he listened to some of the stories, and some of them fairly unpleasant. And the Dean said, this history is regrettable, and I am sorry. That was your experience here. Reverend Murphy said, it was the most healing thing imaginable because nobody had ever said that. And there was a sense of healing when the Dean said, I regret your experiences and the history and we will all move forward together, end quote. This meeting gave us a moment of true repentance and reconciliation. After we spent that day together with the graduates, Dean Markham and I continued to have conversations and the Dean suggested that I write this book. The book project began as a way to formally study and acknowledge the seminary's history in issues of slavery and segregation and race. But I didn't start there. I didn't start with the graduates. I went back to the genesis of the seminary itself. I examined documentation of the existence of enslaved persons on campus. In the 1850s, five of the seven seminary professors owned slaves on campus. In the 1850s, five of the seven seminary professors owned enslaved persons on campus. An astounding 103 out of 112 Episcopal priests in Virginia owned slaves. While VTS as an institution could not own enslaved persons, it is clear that the seminary rented unemployed enslaved persons from local plantations to work at the seminary. One white student, Philip Brooks of Massachusetts, wrote to his brother in 1856, he said, and I quote, all the servants are slaves. Those in the seminary are let out by their masters for so much a year, paid, of course, to the master, 
just as you'd pay for a horse hired, end quote. Phillips Brooks, based on his letters and writings, was immensely bothered by how slaves were treated on campus. Phillips Brooks is the composer of the famous Christmas song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. In 1876, the Board of Trustees at VTS began discussion of the subject of colored students. Virginia Blacks in growing numbers wanted to enter the ministry of the Episcopal Church. During the 1870s, two Black men had been accepted as postulant in the Diocese of Virginia. Then, largely due to the lay Sunday school ministry of a woman by the name of Patty Hicks Buford from Lawrenceville, Virginia, thousands of members and many clergy of the colored Zion Union Apostolic Church in Southside Virginia asked to be received into the Episcopal Church. This merger required access to Episcopal Church education for the existence Zion Apostolic clergy and others desiring to become clergy in the Episcopal Church. This demand for large-scale Episcopal Church clerical education for Blacks in Virginia is considered the direct cause of the establishment of Bishop Payne Divinity School. So in 1878, Virginia Seminary was presented with a clear opportunity to integrate with a gifted prospective student. This gifted prospective student was James Solomon Russell. But instead of accepting Russell to enter VTS, the VTS Board of Trustees resolved on June 20th, 1878, to establish, and I quote, a theological school for colored people and for the present to be located in Petersburg, Virginia, end quote. James Solomon Russell was the first student of Bishop Penn Divinity School, and he spent his ministry building St. Paul's Church and St. Paul's College in Lawrence, Lawrenceville, Virginia the trustees chose to create a segregated branch of VTS attached to a previously established school for Blacks that would become Bishop Penn Divinity School. On November 22, 1884, the school commenced under the name of Bishop Penn Divinity School, an industrial school which would become Bishop Penn Divinity School. Up until the establishment of Bishop Penn Divinity School, the protocol in Virginia was not to encourage black candidates to aspire to the priesthood. The Reverend Joseph Adwell was the only black man ordained as a priest in Virginia prior to the school's establishment. Historian of Black Episcopalians, George Freeman Bragg, observed that, and I quote, it was judged by our good white friends that it was practically impossible for colored men to reach such high eminence, end quote. In the years immediately after the establishment of Bishop Penn Divinity School, it was, and I quote, the policy then that all colored candidates should apply to become candidates for deacons orders only. After their ordination to the diaconate, they were to go forth 
to their ministerial labors. And if they could do that work successfully and find time to prepare to become candidates for priest orders and pass the canonical examinations for the priesthood, they would be accounted worthy of such promotion." End quote. In other words, the bar was set extremely high, higher than their white counterparts. Diocesan council subjugation of most Blacks remained the rule of life in the home dioceses of the Bishop Penn Divinity School until their piecemeal removal in 1932-1948. This proved detrimental to the health and vitality of Black Episcopal clergy and churches. This hypocrisy turned many Blacks away from the Episcopal Church and affected the, the ability of Bishop Penn Divinity School to recruit students. One theory suggests the decline in enrollment prompted the addition of the first Black men to the Bishop Penn Divinity School faculty. Like most institutions for Blacks, inadequate funding was an ongoing difficulty of Bishop Penn Divinity School. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s, the Board of Trustees menace repeatedly document the school's financial troubles. A number of changes were made at Bishop Penn Divinity School to increase the student body, including increasing the number of part-time students and special students from other denominations enrolled. The Bishop Penn Divinity School Board of Trustees included Blacks for the first time in the 1940s. In 1949, eight of the 20, 20 trustees of Bishop Penn Divinity School were Black. Also, a new group was permitted to attend Bishop Penn Divinity School, women. In the 1940s, women were introduced both as students and instructors in the field of Christian education. Ironically, black women were permitted to study at Bishop Penn Divinity School 20 years before Virginia Theological Seminary officially commenced accepting women in 1965. None of these measures significantly increased the enrollment of Bishop Penn Divinity School, added to its financial stability or ensured the continued life of the school. Understanding that no new students had entered the school in 1947 and 1948, here, and I quote, a committee of the three groups in charge of Bishop Penn voted to close it after the commencement exercises in May 1949 and to transfer the faculty and the one remaining student to other Episcopal seminaries. The prelude to the discussion of a merger with Bishop Penn Divinity School and the admission of Blacks to VTS appears in the VTS board minutes of June 4th, 1947. The secretary of the board was instructed to write to the dean of Bishop Penn Divinity School, expressing the continued interest of this board in Bishop Penn Divinity School. The debate about admitting black students to Virginia Seminary began in earnest during the winter of 1949. At a 1949 planning committee meeting, it was voted unanimously that black students, and I quote, now or in the not too distant future be admitted to the seminary with the conditions of residence to be established at the discretion of the board, end quote. Following 
and off the record discussion, Bishop Phillips moved that, and I quote, in view of the seminary's obligation to Bishop Penn, and if the latter is forced to close, the trustees of Bishop Penn Divinity School be notified that its one remaining black student would be admitted to VTS to complete his the theological training, end quote. However, no action was taken upon Bishop Phillips' motion. Instead, it was proposed at that meeting that before any action was taken regarding the establishment of a Negro seminary on the grounds of ETS, a special committee be appointed to study and report to the board on the seminary's future admission policy towards Blacks. This option would further delay desegregation of the seminary. In September 1949, Bishop Penn Divinity School trustees voted not to commence another academic year in September 1949. But it made no official move to finalize its closure or approach another seminary about merger. The VTS board, however, continued to consider educating black men for the ministry. At the November 1950 board meeting, Dean Zabriski reported that, and I quote, the faculty and admissions committee are prepared to admit to the seminary next September a highly recommended and well-prepared Negro applicant from the Diocese of Michigan, end quote. In response, the VTS board recommended to the admissions committee the, accept the acceptance of the Negro application from the Diocese of Michigan if, in their judgment, he be fully qualified to meet the requirements of admission to the seminary. The committee deemed the candidate qualified and with the commencement of the 1951-1952 academic year, the color barrier at Virginia Theological Seminary was broken with a regularly admitted student, John Thomas Walker. John Thomas Walker later became canon and dean of the Washington National Cathedral and the first African-American bishop in the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. Bishop Walker was influential in the completion of the Washington National Cathedral. Whether it was willing to or not, VTS was going to have to face the realities of the changing world. In, the 1950, in 1950, the US Supreme Court questioned the constitutionality policy of separate but equal facilities for Blacks in higher education. Only two years later, the 1952 General Convention of the Episcopal Church passed a resolution stating that no branch of the Christian church should rest content with any injustices in racial relations obtained in parishes, schools, and agencies under her control or in association with her. Finally, in 1954, the US Supreme Court ruled in Brown v. Board of Education that separate but equal educational facilities were inherently unequal and in violation of the equal protection guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. VTS has come a long way since admitting John Thomas Walker in 1951. The good news is the work continues in earnest. In his interview in the book, the, the Reverend Canon Warner Trenum says, the real question is what we have learned and where do we go from here? You can't do restitution. 
what we have to do is amend our life when VTS announced their decision to create a $1.7 million reparation, I recalled my conversation with Canon Trenum over the seminary's need to amend their life. During my time at VTS, we made tremendous progress through the establishment of the Office of Ethnic Ministries and this, and this annual commemoration of Dr. King's martyrdom. The seminary recommitted itself to the Bishop Payne Scholarship Fund assuring that all African-American students would have access to an affordable seminary education. Our curriculum, our music, the way we honor the different ethnic heritages, our community life, all reflect the uniqueness of this community. There was a strong effort to recruit Black students. Dean Markham challenged me to ensure that at least 20% of our entering body, student body, must be students of color. Having a critical mass of students makes a difference in the formative experience and community life of the seminary. In my farewell service at VTS, I said this in my sermon, as I leave the seminary, there's a lot more to be done in the areas of racial and ethnic ministry. But like the apostle Paul says, we know that it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry. So we do not lose heart. This movement of going into all the world and of finding the places where we connect must start with all of us. It must make its way in the VTS boardrooms where decisions are made. It must be lived out in the classroom where the faculty teach students to value their perspectives and experience of persons different from themselves. It must be personified in the refectory, in class meetings, and in all social components of seminary life. Let me close with the words of Isaiah, chapter 58, verses 11 through 12. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, Father Constant, for that excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I'm particularly grateful for the ways that you highlighted some of the missed opportunities, um, kind of almost systematically missed opportunities that uh, the seminary had along the way, and very much appreciate your clarion call uh, at the end of your talk. Um, there are, there's at least one question in the, in the question and answer, and we will we'll do the question and answer after our second presentation. Uh, but others, if you want to uh, add things to the question and answer or to the chat, uh, you're welcome to do that. And at this time, uh, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our second speaker, uh, Dr. Catherine Meeks is executive director of the Absalom Jones Center for Racial Healing. Prior to the center's opening, she chaired its precursor uh, that was called Beloved Community, the Commission for Dismantling Racism for the Episcopal Diocese of Atlanta. A sought after teacher and workshop leader, Dr. Meeks brings four decades of experience to the work of transforming the dismantling racism work in Atlanta. The core of her work has been with people who have been marginalized because of economic status, race, gender, or physical ability as they pursue liberation, justice, and access to the resources that can help lead, help lead them to health, wellness, and a more abundant life. This work grows out of her understanding of her call to the vocation of teacher, as well as her realization that all of humanity is one family which God desires to unite. 
Catherine is the retired Clara Carter Acre Distinguished Professor of Sociocultural Studies from Wesleyan College and founding executive director of the Lane Center for Community Engagement and Service. She characterizes herself as a midwife to the soul of her students and workshop participants. She has spent many years sharing the insights that she gained from her pursuit of the truth. She has had many great teachers, including her sons, the Bible, Jungian psychology, cross-cultural stories, and other books of wisdom. But her greatest teacher is rheumatoid arthritis because it has forced her to learn many new ways to listen to her body and to pay attention to the messages from her heart. She is frequently asked to present commentaries on Georgia Public Radio and other radio and television programs. She's the author of six books and one inspirational CD and is the editor of the best-selling book, Living Into God's Dream, Dismantling Racism in America. And she's the co-author of Passionate for Justice, Ida B. Wells as Prophet for Our Times. She holds a master's degree in social work from Clark Atlanta University and a PhD from Emory University. It is my honor to welcome the Reverend at the do Dr. Catherine Meeks. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm, I always rail against people calling me Reverend, so. <laughs> and I did it, it is, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really delighted to be here tonight to, uh, to help in celebrating the, well, actually not celebrating, but remembering the 52nd year of Dr. King's martyrdom. It's unbelievable to me that it's been, well, actually 52 years and it, how that much time has passed is amazing. But what's more amazing is the present state that we find ourselves in around justice and how many of those issues we still have to address 50 years, 52 years after Dr. King's death. So realizing that makes me feel even more gratitude for having moments like this where we stop to talk about some of those things that are really quite important and cannot be uh, put to the side of the table. Tonight, I want to spend a bit of time talking about reparations, but I want to tell you a short story. And then I like to frame the things that I have to say in, in ways with stories. And, and so the first Thing is the story about a woman named Margaret Garner. And some of you may know that story, particularly if you saw the movie Beloved that uh, was based on Toni Morrison's book. You know that the woman, the character Setha, was based on Margaret Garner. Mar Margaret Garner was a slave who managed to escape from Kentucky up to Ohio and with her four kids, but unfortunately was um, found fairly quickly by the slave owners. And before she was captured, she managed to kill her two-year-old daughter by slashing her throat because she didn't want her daughter to be returned to slavery. And the other children, she was trying to kill all of them, but it didn't quite work out. So she was taken, uh, arrested, and they were trying to decide how they would try her. And they weren't quite sure if they should try her for destruction of property or for murder. And if they tried her for murder, then it would mean that she had killed a person. But if they tried her for destruction of property, it was in keeping with the whole concept of slaves not being human. Now, just I want you just to hold that story and then I want to talk a few minutes about an idea that was um, designed by one of my most important mentors, Dr. Howard Thurman. In his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, he talks about something that he calls the love ethic. And it, this really boils down to being love your neighbor as yourself, but really getting to the core of what it means to really love yourself. And so he talks about this ethic being based up on the activity of getting beyond looking at people 
on the basis of their faults or on the basis of their gifts and assets. To get to the point where you can actually see people as God sees us, as worthy love, people worthy of love, worthy of having a chance to live whatever life God has intended for us to live. To see people beyond their faults, beyond their gifts, to get beyond projecting onto people how they might help us with something rather than just being connected to them because they are valuable and we value them. That's the kind of love that he's talking about. Not this um, kind of a thing that we have around, you know, I love chocolate or I love Valentine's Day or I love Christmas. It's not any of that kind of thing. It's the very, at the very core of ourselves, we have drilled down to knowing who we are and what is at our core. And then we are able to connect to that in other people. And it's, it's, it's something that we have such great need of on this planet at the moment. So the love ethic, to love my neighbor as myself, but myself that I really know and not myself that I made up. And to love my neighbor as himself or herself and not somebody that I projected into reality. Now take that idea and think about what it would mean for us to really and truly think about how we want to do reparations. Think about that as a, as, a, as a lens, as a way to look at how that process ought to be conducted. And then think about Margaret Garner and the kind of, of devastation, the kind of destructive forces that would bring a person to the point of being able to cut the throat of their two-year-old child. And ask, we need to take those two things and hold them in our hands and then ask ourselves, what should our behavior be? I have often heard um, conversations about reparations begin with money. I mean, we, we love to think we can fix everything with money. And some things can be fixed with money, but everything can't be fixed with money. Some things need money and, and some other things. Most of the time when a conversation starts about money, people then go on to wonder how much money is every black person gonna get? And which black folks are gonna get how much money? And are we gonna give money to the Obamas and to the Oprah Winfrey's? And when I hear discussions like that, I know for a fact that it's not a serious discussion. I know for a fact that the folks that are engaging in that discussion are not the thoughtful, caring people that are deeply moved by the inequities in the society and the injustices that have faced us as people of African descent. And there and other people too that have caught in that a lot of those oppressive structures. I know those folks are not having a serious conversation. Because if we're having a serious conversation, we don't start with how many people are gonna get a check for what amount. What amount of money would you give to a Margaret Garner's descendant? What amount of money would you give to people who were kidnapped from their homes and brought to a place where they knew nothing and had, had in, um, them forced to have to figure out how to make a life on the basis of their own um, inner resilience and fortitude and God's great grace. So when we talk about reparations just in terms of let's see what we can do with how much money we can put here or there, we, we stop so short of where we need to be. So I think that the, the, the real conversation about reparations has to engage on a bunch of levels. The levels have to be economic, psychological, uh, they have to be spiritual, they have to be political, and, and we have to be ready to look at those things through the lens of love. So we get past trying to set up um, categories and trying to make uh, um, 
make it an easy journey because it's not an easy journey. Now, I'm not, I'm not here to, to say that anybody who does any effort to try to make things better should be criticized because that's not important to me. It's important to me for us to always be pushing ourselves to be moving into the direction that we need to be going and to be moving on a journey that takes us to some real healing. So for us to look at true reparations, making, repairing the breach that is so divisive in this country at the moment means that we have got to be ready to look at all of the systems of oppression and deconstruct them and be ready to, for a, a spiritual, political, sociological, psychological, whatever word you want to use as a definer, change. So somewhere deep down in the heart of the person who is claiming to be a faith, a person of faith, a person who's trying to love the, your neighbor as yourself, one has to come to terms with what that really means in terms of how are you going to keep on enjoying systems of oppression of the brothers and sisters that you say you love. It's, it, it, those two things just don't go together. You cannot say to me, if you are a person who has benefited from the, uh, the oppressive structures in our country, you cannot say to me, I love you and I want you to have the best, and yet you don't find it within your uh, heart to be challenged to do something about those systems, those systems that keep on separating and, and not only separating us, but actually causing us uh, to suffer and in many times cause us to lose lives. I think it's been said already with this epidemic that we're in at the moment, Black people and poor people are going to suffer far more than anybody else in this country right now in the midst of this epidemic because of these structures that are in place that if we were really serious about doing something to repair the breach, many of those oppressive structures would not be existing and they wouldn't be as strong as they are. So health inequities, education inequities, housing inequities, all of these things that we like to talk about, and then we, then we want to think that we can find a way to do um, some small things somewhere that makes us feel better because we've studied something or we made a contribution here or there. All of the, every, every good act is a good thing, but we do not need to deceive ourselves in thinking that our good acts are really enough. We need to always be on uh, the, the, in the space of interrogating ourselves about what else is it that we need to be doing. So I'm not comfortable just being a person who managed to get a PhD from Emory. I'm not comfortable with that. You know, oh yeah, someone has said to me once, um, actually some white people who thought that I as a black woman had no business saying the stuff I was saying wanted to know why couldn't I just be satisfied because I had a PhD after all. And I said, well, for, first of all, I'm a free person so I can say what I want to say. And second of all, it's not good enough for me to be the one who made it through the crack it, and not be concerned about all the others that are back there somewhere. So if, if there's going to be any talk about love, then there's got to also be some talk about justice. And we love to talk about love. And we love to talk about reconciliation. And we actually are beginning to love to talk about reparations a little bit more. But we've got to start understanding that there's got to be some teeth in the conversation. There's got to be some real willingness to engage the conversation at the level that it needs to be engaged, and then to, to do the work in the ways that it needs to be done. So higher education, seminaries, everywhere we, everywhere we get people together in groups and get to teach people and be with people, we have to always be interrogating these systems in a holistic way that disenfranchise and keep people 
black people, brown people from being who they were put on the earth to be. Every, we don't get to pick and choose. That's the thing, the love demands that you don't get to pick and choose. Love demands that you have got to be consistent. And you know, that's, that's how, I mean, that's, that's the problem with Jesus, you know. Jesus is a problem if you wanna pick and choose because Jesus is this consistent, always, it's, it's, this is how it is. These things have got to be, you don't get today to be here and in one place and then next week you decide that that's too hard so you get to do something else. You know, I say all these things everywhere I speak and I don't like knowing it either because I have to live by it too. And once you know it, you can't quit knowing it. So once you decide that real love means that you don't get to pick and choose, that you've got to care about the person living under the bridge, you've got to be worried about that person and you've got to be doing what you can to make it so that folks don't have to live under bridges. And even if you can't fix it, you've got to carry them in your heart. And so the spiritual piece of reparations is critical because the spiritual peace, the peace that keeps us uncomfortable, the peace that keeps us not willing to just settle into the little spaces that make us feel like we're doing really well, that keep us asking questions, we've got to ha carry that with us. As, as we find money to appropriate to help make things better, we've got to keep asking what else is there that we need to be doing? How much further do we need to dig into this? What, how do we really make this holistic approach to healing, repairing the breach? Repairing the breach is, a, is, is, a, is a, um, an invitation to do a holistic action so that you're not just taking a little, little corner of it, you're taking the whole thing. You're walking into the whole thing saying, yes, here we are. Now, you may have to work at it in pieces. I'm not, you know, everybody can't do everything at the same time. I'm, I'm really clear about that. I'm very pragmatic about the ways in which this work has to be approached. But I do know that we have to be willing to take the piece we can work on and stay conscious about the rest of what we're not doing. And not to lull ourselves to sleep with being so happy because we're working on one little piece. And so I think that any way, any plan that anybody comes up with that, that is trying to approach repairing the breach in whatever ways you're trying to do that, the approach has got to be that you are paying attention to the whole piece of fabric and then you pick picking the piece you can weave on, but as you're weaving, you know that there's a whole quilt, there's a whole cloth. And you don't, you don't let yourself forget that. You don't let the people around you forget that. Because you love the folks you're trying to help. You're not, we're not trying to do this just because we have some money, or we're not even trying to do it just because it's right. We're doing it because we love the folks that have been disenfranchised and have, have had their souls injured and, and still are living the descendants of those slaves, all of us, are still struggling under the, underneath the weight of some of that stuff that happened. And there is no way to repair that breach except to make a world where that kind of wounding doesn't happen anymore. It's not like we can fix all of the folks that are here. We can fix stuff so that new generations don't have to suffer in the same way. Because we've got some traumas that we're just going to die with. And we, but we can do something to make sure that the generations that come after us do not have to be traumatized in the same ways. You know, I, I'm, I'm 74 years old and I've done this work since I was in my 20s. So it, I've been doing this work for over 50 years and I'm gonna do it until the day I die because I'm called to do it because I love people because I love God, because I want to follow Jesus, but it's tiring and it's hard. And there's some days I wish I didn't know what I know, because as I said a few minutes ago, you can't quit knowing what you know. So I want to invite you, 
wherever you are and whoever you are. I want to invite you to really spend some time, particularly now that we're all kind of quarantined in our houses, there's time to think and, and explore and really maybe ask some questions that we didn't ask before. I want you to really ask, what are you after? What are you after when it comes to talking about reparations? What does that mean to you? What do you want to do? Does it have anything to do with loving your neighbor as yourself? Does it have anything to do with your understanding that, that we live in this space that's been so wounded and we have to work in a holistic way to, for healing to come? I want to encourage, invite, and implore everybody to, to spend some time that way in these coming days and weeks. And, and let, us, let us come out of this time of isolation and uh, reflection and, and forced contemplation. Let us come out of it a new people, a different people, a people who see the light a little differently and who are a, just a little bit braver and a little bit more willing to take some chances on loving our brothers and sisters as God loves us and as we love ourselves. Amen. So I, I just want to say, add my amen to that. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Meeks, for that very stimulating presentation um, and for asking that question, what else is it that we need to be doing? The deeply spiritual question that you raise and for bringing up the helpful metaphor of the quilt that we're working on one part of the quilt, but we not need to not forget that there's a whole uh, quilt out there that's a part of, uh, that we are a part of. And uh, I will be uh, borrowing that uh, from you. <laughs> You're so, welcome. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. And so we come now to the question and answer period. Um, we have at least a couple of questions that have come through already. Uh, Sarah and I will be working together to moderate uh, this. And so um, why don't we begin with the question from Alan, which I have actually Okay, I'll go ahead and ask it since you are also great. going to answer it as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so this is really for all of the panelists. Um, and then it's um, and then it's a secondary question, I think, that can be better addressed by um, Reverend Constant and Reverend Dr. Thompson. So the first part of the question is, do you agree or disagree that many problems faced today by the African American community are, quote, legacy of slavery? So let's say, let's say take that in for a second. And then the follow up second question is How does VTS intend to embrace communities of deep seated wounds as a result of slavery and racism within the context of this stimulus reparation? Mm. So I think that Dr. Meeks could actually speak to it as well now that I think about it. Um, so, I, so to readdress the question, the first part of the question, do you agree or disagree that problems faced today by African-American communities are the quote, legacy of slavery? Either one of us to start? Yes, yeah. Yes, please. Whoever, oh, okay. whoever wants yeah. to Jump right in, jump right in. Well, <laughs> We're I, all I unmuted. Think, I think there I think that there are many problems that are that are related to the legacy of slavery. I think some of our problems are just the same kind of problems that, that are universally human issues. I mean, all of us are human beings and all of us are separated from God in some way, and our job is to find our way to to build a bridge to God. So, but but slavery to the, to some of the struggle and not only slavery, but because slavery hasn't really ended, it's just evolved into other things. So, you know, if, if it had ended, then maybe some of the current issues that we have here, because we really would have been able to do something about them because we wouldn't have been fighting the same battles just disguised as other kinds of things. So, but I think slavery, the legacy of slavery is definitely 
a part of the wounding that we have that we have to uh, um, that we have to factor into our journey as Black people and people of African descent. When I think of uh, this question, I often refer to uh, Eugene Robinson's book on um, disintegration, uh, the splintering of Black America, um, in how uh, the legacy of slavery uh, has splintered uh, Black America. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, um, and so I think for me, in my work uh, at Virginia Seminary, the thread uh, continued from the genesis of, of the seminary uh, to today. Um, in terms of how uh, we treat uh, uh, blacks and uh, persons of color uh, on, on, on the campus of Virginia Seminary. So there's no doubt in my mind uh, that the challenges that uh, the black community is facing today goes all the way back uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to slavery uh, because you can really follow the thread. In the same way I could follow, follow the thread uh, in no turning back, I'm sure we can follow the, the thread as well in where we are right now as a nation. Right, but I wanna say also in, in regards to that, that legacy is there and it's been a wounding uh, force, but we as a people have the greatest gifts of resilience and courage and the ability to create and to recreate and to overcome also. And so it's, al it's always this paradox that we need to never lose sight of that we've got the wounds and we've got the struggles and but we have look at us i mean if you were kidnapped from your home and brought to a land where you knew nobody and nothing and you were able to build a life and create a culture that's an amazing thing and and so you know i want to i'm i'm never going to minimize the woundedness but i'm never going to minimize the amazing gifts and talents and and capacity for Create, creating life and, and for, for healing, which is why I think we can do a whole bunch better than we're doing. And uh, I agree with everything that you all have said. And I would, I would just add that one of the, um, in addition to the, the material conditions that uh, are the legacy of slavery, one of the um, sort of ideological legacies of slavery that I talk a lot about in my classes um, comes out of the, the paradox of having slavery in a country that uh, purports to have been founded on the basis of radical ideas about freedom and uh, democracy. Yeah. And so the, the explanation that our nation settled on for why it was okay to enslave persons of African descent is that there was something wrong with black people. Mm -hmm. And that's a habit that our country has um, and that is, has been perpetuated from the earliest days of the Republic. And so that is obviously intimately tied to the material piece of the legacies of slavery. And it's something that you know, has also done um, great harm uh, to the African-American community, but really to our whole, the fabric of our entire society. So um, the second part of the question was uh, about I'm, I'm embracing. And re and repeat it. Um, oh, thank and just you. As a quick reminder that we are taking Q and A's. We can take it over the Facebook chat or um, in the chat box on Zoom. Um, make sure that you are sending it out to all panelists and attendees if you are with us on the Zoom webinar. So the second part of Alan's question is, how does VTS intend on embracing communities of deep-seated wounds as a result of slavery and racism within the context of this stimulus reparation? So I can, I can start uh, a little bit with that. So one of the, one of the um, principles that we're operating on as we begin to do this reparations program is that we don't, as uh, Dr. Meek said, we don't want it to be uh, simply or primarily about um, the money, but rather it is beginning with the idea of building relationship, uh, the idea of recognizing and, and honoring the ancestors and the role that they played in building this institution. Uh, because that's something that has not, it's a, a, they are the, the sort of unsung heroes of the, the uh, seminary story, the people who 
built the buildings and maintained uh, the buildings and did the work to make life possible at the seminary while people were, were studying and being formed for ministry. Uh, that's such an important story. And I can say that um, because we're still, as I had mentioned before, we're still kind of in the research phase, but to the extent that I've begun to have some conversations with uh, a few of the descendants at this point, um, it has been incredibly powerful when we've had conversations and uh, we talk about the anc their ancestor who worked at the seminary uh, and they understand that you know, we really do want to have a conversation about how to memorialize their ancestor, how to bring them into the history uh, that has, you know, the, that has been told of the seminary without ever including some of those individuals to now include those individuals and to tell that as part of the story. That has been incredibly moving and meaningful, I think, to, to those descendants and is part of healing some of those, uh, some of those uh, wounds. Uh, so I don't know if uh, other panelists want to speak on that. Virginia Seminary has a wonderful opportunity uh, to welcome new students every year. Uh, and they are being trained uh, to become lay leaders in the church they are, uh, and, and other institutions. And they, are be trained, they are being trained to become ordained leaders in the church as well. And I remember in my interview with uh, the, Rev the very Reverend uh, uh, Robert Wright, the right Reverend Robert Wright, who's now Bishop of Atlanta, in his interview, um, Bishop Wright talks about the purpose of the church. He says that the purpose of the church is to worship the Lord and to invite people to be transformed. Uh, and we as a seminary community, we have a wonderful opportunity to invite people to be transformed. And he said, I hope Virginia stays clear about that. It's, a, it's also a leadership role. It's not a nice people job, he said. It's a leadership role. And as Dr. Meek says, he said, I mean, Jesus does it so wonderfully well. And so I think for me, knowing that we have this wonderful opportunity uh, to transform men and women and set, send them into the world with the diversity that we have on campus, for me, it's all, it all starts on campus. This work of reparation, it all starts in the VTS boardrooms. It all starts in the, in the classrooms. It starts in the refectory, where if you are students of color, the food has to represent who, we, who you are. And so I think for me, that work has to be done well on the VTS campus, and then we take it out into the world. Because as a student, as, as a former student of VTS, as a former staff member, I always adv advocated for VTS to be more than what, than what it is now. Because uh, for as long as we exist, the opportunity to be more is always going to be there. Thank you. Um, so we now have uh, some questions that are coming up in the question and answer box. Um, before we get to those, there's one thing that I, I did want to um, address uh, about just the, the historical piece of slavery at the seminary. Uh, for a long time, we, we thought that, um, or was the historical evidence suggested that the seminary did not own slaves, right? But that, it, you know, it hired people out and so on and so forth. But uh, the, the research team has actually uh, found uh, some evidence that seems to indicate otherwise, which is not really surprising. And so I, uh, I asked Chris Pote, uh, the archivist who's been working on this, to give me just a little uh, summary of, of that work, uh, that research. And what he has written to me is that in the 1830s and 1840s, VTS and representatives of VTS consistently show up on Fairfax County tax rolls, counting enslaved individuals as property. So we have very good evidence now that uh, you know, the, the seminary did, in fact, uh, own slaves uh, as property. And so uh, that's just something, you know, that I just wanted to, to, uh, to mention. Um, so let's look at the questions in the question and answer here. Um, I think let's start with uh, this question uh, from 
Andrew Lasso, who asks, as far as we know, how has BTS's commitment to reparations served as an example that other institutions have followed? Who else has followed suit after our announcement? Um, I can't necessarily say that uh, institutions have followed, you know, our, us and followed our example, but certainly there are others that have uh, made announcements subsequently to ours. Um, the ones that I know about, I, I know about, uh, I've heard about the Diocese of uh, Georgia announcing uh, an initiative, uh, the Diocese of New York, Diocese of Texas, uh, the Diocese of Maryland, and Bishop uh, Eugene Sutton in the Diocese of Maryland, even before we were doing what we were doing, was uh, also talking um, about uh, reparations and is, and is, you know, has, has voted to have a, a program of reparations. Uh, so there are other institutions that are also engaged uh, in this work and that we should be definitely in conversation uh, with. Um, the next question that I will uh, address here is from uh, Julia uh, Dominic, who asks, uh, how do you use your voice in the spaces of systemic racism when you are dismissed under the guise of reparation? What does it say that this amazing program was required how can we address that we should want to work on these tough conversations? And so uh, I'll open that up, that question up to our panelists. Now this program tonight was required. Is that what the questioners? Yeah, it's one of, this is one of the programs that uh, we, we say that we expect all seminarians and faculty to participate in. And I think mm -hmm. uh, Julia's kind of asking, you know, what does it say that it has to be? expected and shouldn't we shouldn't people want to work mm -hmm. on these tough conversations mm -hmm. well <laughs> i taught uh, classes that on um race and prejudice for over 30 years and many times i had students where well, the classes were not required it was an elective and students showed up for it i do dismantling racism workshops now in the Episcopal Church, and Episcopalians know that those classes are required. So I think requiring people to show up in some of these spaces is fine. I wish we didn't have to do that. I wish that people would show up on their own, but but folks, some folks will, most folks won't. And so it's I think it's a good thing for things to be required. I, I understand, um, the 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 uh, kind of um, angst that the questioner may be feeling about why there aren't more people that uh, feel like this is something they need to be doing, and that's true for black and white people and brown people because for one thing, black folks and brown people are just kind of tired of talking about all this stuff all the time, even though we don't have the right to get tired because our our ancestors suffered way more than we have, so we can even talk about being tired. Mm -hmm. So I don't like for us to be saying we're tired because I think you, you have to keep on working. When white people can make the choice to do this or not do it, I mean, you can do it when it's convenient. And that gets to be tiring too, to, to realize that, that you know, even for progressive white people, you can always decide when and where to enter. For people of color, that decision is not always so easy. You don't have a choice many times, even though sometimes you may choose not to do, may, you may make a choice for yourself. It's not a real choice. It's, and you never feel good about it because you know that something was said or done that you should have spoken up about. So I just think that that's the space we're in. We're in this country where we have uh, serious racial division everywhere, including the church. And we are just up against having to get people in the room in whatever ways we can. And hopefully we can keep them there long enough so that they'll discover that it was a room they really wanted to be in or they needed to be in. No, it is definitely hard work. It is hard work. It is demanding. It requires for all of us to be uncomfortable at times. It's, it requires sacrifice. Um, and, uh, and for me, as, a, as, a, uh, as an institution, whether it's Virginia Seminary, it has to be required. Uh, if, if it's left as an elective, uh, it's not going to happen uh, because we have to determine how important this work is. 
And so I think for me, a, a, a class a requirement to ensure that we have, uh, we have a class that is focused on the history that we are discussing here is critical. Ensuring that every student read No Turning Back the Black Presence at Virginia Seminary is, is, it must be a requirement. And so I wonder today how many students will leave Virginia Seminary and not have had the opportunity uh, to read No Turning Back and to engage in conversation about it. So I think for me, it has to be a requirement. Otherwise, we're going to miss an opportunity. Thank you. Um, so we are just about out of time, but we have lots of you know, comments and questions that are coming in. And Sarah, is there a way, before we have the closing one or two questions, is there a way for us to sort of record these questions and maybe you know, panelists can answer them by email later or something along those Absolutely. lines? Okay, uh, great. <clears throat> um, so then um, I wanted to ask this question. Uh, this one comes from uh, someone who's unnamed. Um, what are some concrete activities in which someone might engage to foster racial reconciliation beyond talk? Hmm. You know, I, I'm always very hesitant to tell people what they ought to be doing. But because I feel like that you need to be listening to your heart and to God and your conscience and your understanding of right and justice in the world to know how to treat people. But I do think that you, you can speak up for folks that, that you, that you have, if you're a white person you, and you have a sense of agency that people around you, people of color may not have or may not seem to think they have, you can speak up, you can speak up in situations where as a white person, you could have kept your mouth closed and gotten away with it just fine, but you choose not to, to do that. And white progressives need to learn how to allow black folks and brown people to really have power and express that power. That's, that, is a, that is a key contribution that white progressives can make to racial healing is to be willing to honor the power and the being empoweredness that that people of color have, and I'm and I don't mean to be um, just kind of tolerating it. I mean to really embrace it and respect it and be glad about it. That I think that's a major challenge for progressive white people. I've, that I, at least in my experience, that's been the case. I, that progressives usually get uh, real quiet when they have to really be subject to black and brown power. So, I, you know, those are just a couple things that just pop off the top of my head about it. Um, no, absolutely. I think it's definitely about, you know, using our voice, using the opportunity that we have in the position that we have. Um, because again, for me, every, any position that I find myself, I ask the question, how, how am I called to lift somebody up in the position that I'm in? Um, and it goes whether you, you're white or whether you're black, because again, as a black person, you also have to ask the question, um, how do you lift up uh, a brother or how do you lift up a sister in the position that you find yourself into? Uh, because we are all blessed uh, to, uh, to actually uh, occupy positions that those who came before us did not have the opportunity. And so because of that, I have, I have a unique <coughs> obligation. I have an obligation uh, to actually leave VTS just a little bit better than the way I found it. Thank you both. Um, and then I'm going to pose one final question, uh, being conscious of the time. And this one comes from uh, Dr. Lisa Kimball, uh, who says, uh, I hear Dr. Meeks speaking to the resilience and courage formed in our new lives at the font. Might the work of reparations be viewed as a necessary expression of that which we renounce at baptism? Oh, as a part of atonement? Yes, I think so. Yeah, the renunciation yeah. of evil, and uh, that's what I'm hearing right. in the question. Well, I, of course. I mean, I think that, you know, uh, that's exactly right. I mean, it, it can certainly, it, it, I think that certainly uh, making things right, repairing the breach, seems to me that that's a part of 
once you've repented, then you've got to do something. And that's part of the something that you can do. And it's, it's it, you know, that, that could be atonement, it seems to me. Thank you. And Father Constant, any remarks on that? No, no that's perfect. That's good. Okay. <laughs> well, with that, um, I want to thank our panelists um, again for these very stimulating presentations. You've given us so much to think about. I really am grateful for the time and the energy uh, that you put into it for being with us this evening. I want to thank all of the attendees uh, for, for tuning in, for the great questions. Um, as I said, uh, Sarah is going to uh, save the questions and we'll uh, perhaps be getting back to some of you by email or other means, uh, because we want this, to, this conversation uh, definitely to continue. And I'm actually going to close us out very um, quickly here with a, a quotation from ta Coates and his article, The Case for Reparations. And I'm raising this because uh, next week, when you meet uh, most of you, some, some, uh, some of our staff members will be meeting tomorrow morning to talk about tonight's presentation, but our seminary and formation groups will not be meeting as usual tomorrow morning, but we'll be meeting a week from now, or a week from tomorrow morning uh, on next Thursday. And I'm going to offer this as some food for thought, and I'll be sending this out uh, to you. But uh, this is a quote from ta Coates talking about uh, his understanding of what reparations should be all about. And I'm going to uh, read this and then we'll close for the evening. And he writes, we invoke the words of Jefferson and Lincoln because they say something about our legacy and our traditions. We do this because we recognize our links to the past, at least when they flatter us. But black history does not flatter American democracy. It chastens it. The popular mocking of reparations as a harebrained scheme authored by wild-eyed lefties and intellectually unserious black nationalists is fear masquerading as laughter. Black nationalists have always perceived something unmentionable about America that integrationists dare not acknowledge. That white supremacy is not merely the work of hot-headed demagogues or a matter of false consciousness but a force so fundamental to America that it is difficult to imagine the country without it. And so we must imagine a new country. Reparations by which I mean the full acceptance of our collective biography and its consequences is the price we must pay to see ourselves squarely. Won't reparations divide us? Not any more than we are already divided. The wealth gap merely puts a, a number on something we feel but cannot say, that American prosperity was ill-gotten and selective in its distribution. What is needed is an airing of family secrets, a settling with old ghosts. What is needed is a healing of the American psyche and the banishment of white guilt. What I'm talking about is more than recompense for past injustices more than a handout, a payoff, hush money, or a reluctant bribe. What I'm talking about is a national reckoning that would lead to a spiritual renewal. Mm -hmm. The words of ta Coates. Again, thank you all. Blessings as you go about the rest of your evening. And we will see you soon. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.